will be talking to you today about the power of personal narration. It is a great honor to be sharing this digital stage with such an exciting group of speakers and also it is a privilege to be able to communicate and reach out in those difficult times of health crisis, of uncertainty and social isolation. So it was just a couple of months ago that I gave a talk about women in science where I discussed visibility, representation and equality and made a clear-cut connection of those issues to intersectional feminism. Indeed, a great deal of the societal inequalities and exclusions we come across can be interpreted differently if seen under the prism of pri privilege and this is what intersectional feminism flags the fact that all inequalities are not born equal. I had concluded that talk by calling for action and inviting women of power and position to stand up for the community and share their stories of inequality and hardship. My indication then was that the COVID-19 pandemic may in fact serve as a catalyst for a fresh discussion in society and the beginning of a new feminist stand. Coming back to this day, that talk almost echoes prophetic as we are in the midst of a Me Too outbreak in Greece that is rocking society with shocking revelations and is shaking all the alliances and combinations of power, thus leading to new ones where the weaker parts are currently attracting public attention and for historical first, dominating the discussion. That is women. And it is the women that are standing up and speaking out. They are narrating their stories of suffering violence, of sexual harassment, blackmail and stalking. To be more exact, it started with women and is currently expanding to the sometimes even bigger taboo of male victimization. I applaud them all for having managed to shift the narrative. The why is she or he speaking now question is currently reversed to the how much she or he must have suffered and how did she or he manage to find the courage and strength to speak up statements. And they have also reversed the focus of attention from the victimizers to the victims and have become the mirror where the ugly truth of the perpetrator's crimes is finally reflected upon. Importantly, I would like to note here that the power of telling one's personal story is not new and should not be overlooked. It has a profound significance both for the individual and for society at large. To this end, last spring, in the wake of the pandemic, I organized a series of lectures at the University of Ioannina where I invited prominent figures from the literary and art Greek scene, namely the authors Isidoro Zurgos, Nina Rappi, Marios Karakatsanis, and the singer and songwriter Alkinos Ioannidis. The title of the seminars was, the running theme, was narration and storytelling as means to construct identity in times of hardship. My students participated to those seminars and we would read excerpts in English kindly provided by the authors and then discuss with the authors, with the artists about why and how they write and about the relationship between their identity or the identities that they carry and their writing. I should say here that the students came from both the sciences and the humanities and this type of scholarly interactions in mixed academic audiences is quite unusual. Well, you know, it was a fantastic experience. A large group of students formed that participated in all of the lectures. Very clear conclusions were drawn about the importance of I shan't say finding about the importance of using our voice, everybody has a voice, to speak about the stories, about the good stories or the bad ones that have shaped us into who we are, of coming into a discussion about our experiences and expectations and of coming into this discussion with the identities that we carry. What is more, hard times, dark times, as the ones that we are currently experiencing, are calling even more for this process to take place as we need to be reminded or to rediscover who we are and who we aspire to become. 
If I may also add, not surprisingly, a strong appreciation of science came out of these joint mixed um, meetings, but also this narration, um, sorry, this notion of science as a tool and as a way to serve the humanity. So a strong humanitarian notion and consensus was established there and then in our collective understanding. This idea of incorporating narration and storytelling into education and of encouraging students to use their voice and discover their identities is not new to me, particularly when it comes to teaching science students. I teach academic English at university and prior to engaging in academic writing, before I train them into technical writing, I ask students to work on pre-writing techniques such as free writing, so they engage in those pre-writing strategies. <clears throat> in particular, I use art prompts such as opera singing, film, modern dance and theatre and ask them, well, to write. It is surprising how well this methodology is received. Uh, students write and they write from their heart and they write personal stories. I particularly remember in the early days of my post at the university, there were various reactions. So some students would just burst into tears while doing group writing. There would be vivid discussions taking place after class. Students would just go home and continue writing and they would send texts or long letters to me on the topic. The experience seemed to be liberating, especially when it comes to science students. Science students often feel overwhelmed with work and stress and they rarely have the chance to be creative or focus on their stance or their view of the knowledge they are handling or the structures that they are part of. Interestingly, my, also my most recent research highlights that these pre-writing strategies, this writing of personal stories, actually contributes to the alleviation of technical writing related stress. So there is a clear academic benefit for the students, not just personal benefit. At this point, I would like to say that I'm a strong advocate for a gender, visibility, tolerance-friendly education. I have actively incorporated such elements into my academic and school teachings. Creating stream educational opportunities, when I'm talking about stream, stream is science, technology, reading, ed, um, engineering, arts, and maths, joined together, where all of these meet together in education, so that's what stream is all about, Creating those education opportunities where students can engage in interactive, interdisciplinary activities is a methodological aim of my work. But also creating safe spaces where students can participate by carrying their personal identities and using their voice to tell their stories is an ongoing objective of mine. So to give you an example, recently my students and I created such a safe space. We created a social club last semester where we actively defined such a space, we came up with the rules of how to operate it, and we explored themes close to our interests, such as human rights, bias, prejudice, amongst others. Therefore, to conclude this talk, the powerful ongoing Me Too momentum in Greece may actually carry enough weight for the feminist radicalization of a whole generation of young women and men. This remains to be seen. But this also presents educators with a challenge and an opportunity to radically expand their educational approaches from teaching boundaries and consent to creating spaces for voices to be heard and people and their stories to be acknowledged. It is the educators and the education policy makers' responsibility for tomorrow's education to reflect this shift, this change of society and culture. Thank you.